Awesome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Let me just boot up here. Now, it does appear that I'm unable to, I don't have permission to share my, uh, my camera right now. So for now, I'll just stay off camera and launch into my presentation here. My name is Zane McDonald, and I'm the lead analyst. I'm the lead hydrogen analyst at S&P Global Platts. Today, I want to be talking to you about low-carbon hydrogen markets. Now, at Platts, one of the things that, that we really specialize in is looking at long-term decarbonization scenarios. Now, anybody that's spent any time looking into long-term decarbonization scenarios will know that any ambitious climate target to be achieved requires a real mosaic of solutions. Decarbonization of the power sector and broader use of electrification really underpin a lot of decarbonization efforts, but to extend past decarbonization of the power sector and really achieve broad-based cross-sectoral decarbonization, you need to employ uh, tools that can extend past electrification and past scenarios where, or past sectors where electrification is really a common sense tool. And this is where hydrogen starts to become very interesting for us. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about low carbon hydrogen markets, but really I think the best place to start is to look at the hydrogen markets of today. So in 2019, roughly 74 million tons of pure hydrogen were consumed globally. The bulk of this hydrogen was consumed in the refining sector with the, remaining, with the remainder largely being consumed within ammonia production. Now, as you can see in 2020, there was a significant dip here and that's almost entirely due to impacts from the coronavirus. Restrictions on travel really uh, uh, caused downward pressure on the refining sector and refinery runs, which reduced hydrogen consumption. And similarly, a reduction in, in liquid hydrocarbon consumption reduced the call on energy crops. And with less energy crops being consumed globally, we saw less of a need for fertilizer produced from ammonia, which was produced from hydrogen. And because of those two impacts, you saw a reduction in 2020 hydrogen demand something that we anticipate beginning to rebound, rebound in 2020, although we're still seeing travel restrictions. I do believe that, that today we started to see some good news on the virus front about potential peaking of, of uh, virus cases in the U.S., uh, some potential light at the end of the tunnel, um, with a, a full rebound coming in 2022 for the hydrogen markets. Now, you can see that the vast majority of hydrogen production today is coming from fossil feedstocks, largely natural gas, and, and with the remainder uh, mostly coming from coal gasification. And, and this, this kind of existing institutional fossil-based hydrogen market is really a, a, a good segue into discussing the first topic that I want to cover today in the low carbon hydrogen markets. And obviously here I'm alluding to blue hydrogen. So in 2019, Platts uh, embarked on a project to begin tracking hydrogen production assets and the announcement of upcoming, uh, the announcement of the, the pipeline of upcoming hydrogen production projects. And so that's what I'm showing you here in this bar chart. So just to be clear, this isn't a, a forecast that Platts created. This is actually the capacity of blue hydrogen that's in the pipeline set to come online by 2025. So one interesting thing that you'll notice here is that across the next four years or so, we anticipate seeing, based on the projects in the pipeline, a near doubling of blue hydrogen production capacity. And this, this makes sense when you look at all of the value that blue hydrogen has to bring to the table. Blue hydrogen utilizes existing infrastructure that's in the ground today, as well as leveraging a very mature technology that uh, uh, broadly industrial manufacturers are very familiar with very efficient at employing, and because of these two factors, enables very low cost production of low carbon hydrogen. Kind of concurrent to that, blue hydrogen enables low carbon hydrogen production at scale. 
So these three factors, being able to make a lot of low carbon hydrogen, being able to make it cheap and being able to make it fast, really positions blue hydrogen to be a technology solution that lets momentum build very quickly on low carbon hydrogen supply. And of concurrently, and, and maybe this is a, a pro for, for uh, uh, energy, uh, domestic energy security hawks, and, and for a lot of environmentalists, this is actually a con for blue hydrogen, but blue hydrogen also provides an off-ramp for uh, fossil assets in a deep decarbonization regime, a deep decarbonization world that we're increasingly seeing in net zero commitments around the world. Now, one thing that I think is very important to note here is that for blue hydrogen to really hit commercial scale, first we'd have to see the deployment of commercial carbon capture and storage technology. So before I move on to the next slide, I actually wanna, I wanna draw your attention to 2020 and 2021 here. So this is the current paradigm of blue hydrogen today. And you can see up to and, and potentially over two thirds of blue hydrogen production capacity globally today is, is located in North America. And this broadly aligns with the number of active projects of carbon capture and storage globally. You can see the US by leaps and bounds is home to the most carbon capture and storage projects. So if we're going to see broad based utilization of blue hydrogen technology, then we need to start to see commercialization of CCS technology around the world, more on par with what we're seeing in these very early days in the US. Now, this brings me to the second technology bucket that I wanna to talk to you about today. And so here I'm showing you a, a similar graphic. This is the global cumulative planned renewable hydrogen capacity. So this is the, the capacity of projects in the pipeline for renewable hydrogen production. Largely here, I'm talking about PIM electrolysis, alkaline electrolysis, but also there's some, some more niche technologies here, biologic-based technologies, biomass-based technologies, the sulfur iodine cycle, all at play within the projects that you see here out through 2025. Now, this graphic, you know, we track this where we're finding new projects every single day. This graphic has been fascinating to watch develop across the last year. Um, concurrent with the, the rapid uh, releases of national hydrogen strategies, we've really seen the number of projects for renewable hydrogen production go gangbusters. Um, just 11 or 12 months ago, the 2025 capacity for renewable hydrogen production was below 0.5 million tons. So you can see it has nearly tripled across the last 12 months as we've seen national hydrogen strategies coming out in Portugal, in France, in Spain, in Germany, the European Commission. We've seen strategies coming out of Australia. We're anticipating strategies in the UK. We're anticipating strategies in Canada and in Russia. So really, this underpins the value of government strategies in helping to uh, spur investment into these new technologies. Now, as we compare and look at these, the, the development of these two disparate supply chains for low carbon hydrogen, it's very interesting to also look at the offtake agreements that are surrounding these projects that are in the pipeline. And if you think about it, it really makes a lot of sense what you're seeing here. Fossil hydrogen is, is a process and a technology that's been employed for decades by industrial players. And so it, it makes a lot of sense that the fossil hydrogen with carbon capture and storage or blue hydrogen supply is largely characterized by the same players that are using hydrogen today. And that's industry, which is, is largely here uh, made up of refining and the chemical sector. Looking on the other side here, electrolysis and renewable hydrogen is largely uh, uh, produced in very small scale and produced in a distributed fashion. And we're seeing most of the offtake for renewable hydrogen and electrolytic hydrogen coming from new sectors and new demand sources like mobility, like gas grid injection, like combined heat and power. 
So really a big uncertainty for blue hydrogen and the future of blue hydrogen is can fossil hydrogen with carbon capture and storage begin to attract some of these new markets, some of these new demand sources for hydrogen. So another topic that I think is, is really valuable to talk about is production price of low carbon hydrogen. And I don't want to spend too much time talking about this because I know some of my colleagues on the panel have a lot of great content here. But I do think it's valuable to make one point, and that is the impact and the sensitivity of hydrogen production costs to capex and to uh, energy feedstock costs. We believe that similar to battery technology in the EV and mobility space, deployment of electrolysis technology will result in significant economies of scale, significant learning by doing, and through these pathways from 2020 to 2040, we could see a significant decline in the capital cost of electrolyzers. That said, even looking at 2040 technology with significant declines in capital cost, it's not really a, a super game changer. You still have to see power prices below $30 per megawatt hour before uh, renewable hydrogen could even begin to be cost competitive with blue hydrogen per our modeling. And so this really highlights the fact that at the end of the day, one of the, the most important sensitivities for renewable hydrogen production is the cost of feedstock electricity. So to this end, it's not surprising that countries that have expressed an ambition to export renewable hydrogen really mirror the countries that have high renewable resource availability. We saw Chile making uh, uh, significant announcements for hydrogen exports, saying that hydrogen exports could account for 10% of their GDP and up to half of their exports. Morocco has already pinned agreements with Germany to jointly develop hydrogen production trade. Um, we've seen Australia enter into to very ambitious agreements to supply hydrogen uh, up the eastern coast of Asia. And, and very interesting to me, Saudi Arabia is set to host a four gigawatt renewable power electrolysis and, and hydrogen production facility where they'll take that renewable hydrogen that they produce and turn it into renewable ammonia and export that renewable ammonia. And this is, is very interesting to me because it highlights the, the high costs associated with transporting hydrogen. Moving hydrogen from A to B in, in our modeling, in Platt's scenarios, we've seen that it can account for 50 to 85% of the cost to, to deliver a rack kilogram of hydrogen. So this shows that transportation is, is a huge uncertainty associated with the development of hydrogen. And any of these import export scenarios and supply chain options always have to be weighed against distributed production where feedstock energy costs might be higher, but you can sidestep some of those very burdensome transportation costs. Another key uncertainty with the development of low carbon hydrogen markets in the short term is the, the fact of carbon efficacy and carbon efficiency. Every kilowatt hour of renewable power that is used to produce a kilogram of renewable hydrogen is a kilowatt hour of renewable power that's not being used to decarbonize the grid. And this is a, a factor that policymakers are really going to have to focus on in these early days as they set up policies to begin to uh, uh, develop around low carbon hydrogen markets um, and, and to incentivize development of supply of low carbon hydrogen, where on one hand, you, you want to develop policies that incentivize investment in supply for low carbon hydrogen, but on the other hand, you do not want to erode the efforts of decarbonization of the grid. Now, looking at time, I realize I'm short here, so I actually just want to leave you with this graphic here as a, a brief uh, intro into some of the information that we can talk about. Both my colleagues will certainly talk about in the 
the demand side for low carbon hydrogen, as well as, as something that we can potentially talk about in the questions. Here I'm showing some of the sectors that we believe low carbon hydrogen has the potential to make a play, as well as the broad decarbonization potential of low carbon hydrogen across those sectors. And so with that, looking at the time, thank you. And I'm going to hand things over to my colleague, Mark Molina.